So Kate, I know you were connected to Brian's story through HBO. Um, talk about that process of getting to know her and, and delving into uh, her, her story. It was, you know, yes, I felt incredibly lucky that she's alive. Um, and um, she, on the other hand, wasn't so sure she wanted to do this. She really was traumatized um, by those, you know, that one random sunny afternoon that, you know, from the outside looks like it's, uh, however physically brutal it, it was and is, you know, obviously so, um, it uh, is really hard, at least for me, to fathom the emotional you know, fallout from that, which really goes on and on and on. And so it took Brianna a while to really, um, you know, in her own life, um, decide to start to talk about this um, beyond just sort of the initial news flashes that happened around the case in Austin. Um, so she, you know, had to sort of sniff us out, and Dave and I went down there, and she decided, you know, maybe something good can come out of this. Um, and I think that this whole experience this week has been so great for her to come um, and greet an audience. She was here a couple of days ago, and really believe that uh, it's helped her heal, you know, and all this stuff. So I, it's exciting. We want to take it out and, and you know, probably tour with Brian to to get conversations going around race and law enforcement and and um, gender issues too. So it's, you know, it was a great fit. I love Brian, and I just feel so, so happy to have worked with her and, you know, HBO and Sheila Nevins and Lisa Heller have a, a deep, deep empathy for people like that, so, Thank yeah. You. And Tom, help, tell us how you found Edmonds. Before I do that, can I introduce my colleague, Lenny Noisette? Yes. Uh, who's the, who heads up the uh, justice program at uh, the Soros Foundation Open Society Institute. And um, uh, his, uh, it, Soros stepped in and, and gave me a grant at a crucial moment, but actually his expertise is such that he, he can and should speak to either of the either of the two films. I just stumbled into this story. Some, some, some stories you really research and, and earn, and other times you get invited to a friend of yours who I think is here, David Waltuk. Yes, good. And, and Karen, Karen and David Waltuk, who are friends and who are chefs, and who, uh, and, and Brandon was uh, there at dinner, and he announced to me that he was going to be opening the greatest French restaurant in the United States. Um, uh, which took a little guts because he was at the table with David Waltuck, who did Chanterelle, so I, I, that sort of like woke me up a little bit. And then he said, it's going to be in Cleveland, okay, and it's going to be staffed entirely by people just out of prison. So I just, uh, my good fortune was that he was telling me that before he'd started, right. so I could just get in on the ground floor and watch the chaos unfold. <laughs> um, so both films uh, take people in circumstances that are usually handled um, or usually addressed through a headline or an issue. And you, you put a face and a character to these issues. Um, talk about balancing that in the film. You don't want it to focus just on the character, right? You do want to highlight this issue, but you also want to strike that balance. Talk about both in both of the films. Um, this was... Uh, I hope it doesn't feel that way. It was actually an extremely difficult film to edit. Um, uh, Nick August Berna, the masterful editor, co uh, uh, cooperated and struggled with it with me. But what was hard was that we wanted to make it an ensemble piece so that it wouldn't feel about one person. It would feel about reentry itself. In order to do that, you had to bounce from people to people. You had to feel like it was a, a, a group that you were encountering, and that was tricky in a, in, because I also wanted to keep the film very short. Um, I, I, I shouldn't say this in front of Lenny, but actually I was deeply ignorant of, of justice issues. I just sort of thought that this was an interesting story and should follow it. In a strange way, I think my ignorance may have worked for me because I really didn't come in with a whole agenda to spell out. I just fell in love with these people and started just doing a portrait of them, and then as they got into trouble, I think that one senses both that one really wants them to succeed and also that it's not 
just a, you know, it's not just as simple as giving somebody a set of civilian clothes and, and 25 bucks and, a, and, a, and even a job, that, it, that, that, that there's trauma and that there's uh, addiction issues and so forth. But I just, all I did was just follow my people uh, that I was, and, and then a broader story hopefully emerges. Can you share your mic? Your sure, I mean, I mean they're, they're very different films and in a way they make a nice coupling because ours is so centered on one person and yours is obviously an ensemble piece. But with Brian, what we at least were thinking is to balance the real particularities of what a, obviously a sterling person she is. With at the same time, she's an emblem for a really enormous issue in the United States of, about identity and race and police relations. And we wanted to take a particular story and let the general just emerge by itself, rather than telling you what to yeah. think, just like yours. Just you don't, watch, you, watch and you don't happens. have to do that, right? Exactly. And I think, it's, you know, that's my, what I love about documentaries is you don't try to tell the story and have a Wikipedia piece. You, you just find a story and tell it, and hopefully broader themes emerge if you tap into the right elements of it. And that's what we tried to do. Did you, did, did, did you, were you going to say? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'll yeah. take this. Uh, so as, as um, Tom said, I work for the Soros Foundation, the Open Society Foundation, um, but I spent my whole career uh, prior to that as a public defender here in New York City. Um, and I think that what I liked about both films is it, it's so hard to sort of um, capture how to tell the story of people in these non-one-dimensional ways. And I think that the, the way in which you sort of um, showed the complexity in your film of why uh, an accomplished woman like that sort of might have the reaction that she had to the police of fear that then triggered kind of that whole series of events I think was really a very thoughtful and sort of way. And similarly, I think that the, the, um, the, 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 the ensemble perhaps, um, approach really I think showed all the different things that folks are struggling with um, as they come back into society in addition to trying to get a job, right? And I think that together you really demonstrated that it's an enormous sort of challenge to come back into society and get your life back together. And I think it's not an easy story to tell. And so I really commend all of you for sort of really telling a very human story in a very touching way. So Lenny, I want to put you on the spot for a second, which is that their film is very much about race. In my film, there's almost no reference to race, even though race is is clearly in the mix. D any reaction to 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 yeah, that? I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think that race is is, is front and center. Um, anytime you talk about criminal justice in the United States, if you're honest about it, right? And I think that the assumptions that you make about the people who are involved in the criminal justice system and why they're in the justice system and who they are, I think, is all caught up in race. And so I think that you don't have to name the race issue in your um, in, in your film because I think the, by telling the stories of the individuals, many of whom were African American, I think it gets the point. Kate, talk about um, editing the footage of um, Brian's arrest and in, uh, interaction with the cop against um, the more profile, uh, like observational portion of the film, like how you decided to balance each and, and intercut each. Um, well, you know, it was very uh, liberating to make a short, first of all. It's, it's like having a, it's an entirely different vocabulary than doing a feature-length documentary. So much fun. So much fun. And, you know, it's, 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 I kept thinking it's sort of, it's like when you go to a foreign country and you don't know a language well and you're trying hard to communicate with the few words you have so you make everyone count, you know. And, and there, so I feel like, you know, with a few ingredients, um, I had to be very precise um, and didn't have to weave in a kind of chess game kind of way an enormously long story. So for me, the central cutting was around two basic elements, you know, the police dash cam, and we were lucky to get multiple angles of that. And Brian's own life, which is, you know, filled with, you know, integrity and, and um, passion, and she happens to be talented. Um, in many areas, but really more than anything, she's just she's just a human being, you know, ha living her everyday life, and then at one random instantaneous moment, everything can change, and 
And so I, I wanted to, the cutting itself to remind people um, in a somewhat startling way, I hope, you know, that, that things really can change and the world is out there to kind of remind people who look like Breonna King um, that, you know, one false move and they're really in trouble, you know. So, you know, there's a systemic um, racism and, and wariness that she, that tails her. And so I wanted us, the, an audience, to a little bit be in her shoes as much as I could do in half an hour um, and imagine what that's like. Hence this kind of almost like the brakes go on and there's this intercutting that, um, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I the guess same question. Uh, well, no, because you are dealing more in a fast-paced, long hours, you know, individuals kind of reeling, dealing with challenges. So a different set of challenges, but yeah. talk about the ones that you faced. Well, I think the, the tricky thing with an ensemble piece and what made this actually an extremely uh, difficult and long edit for a short film was that you have to introduce each individual person and then make somebody in a very short amount of time connect to that person. And then when you come back to them, you have to be developing their character, but you also have to be developing the overall film. So you're doing a lot of things at once. And, um, and I was very lucky to have support from Holly Peterson and, and, and others who, that made it possible to be patient because it was in fact many weeks of editing. And as I say, I hope it doesn't feel that way, but in fact it was tough. And how long was the shoot? Oh, God. Well, it's sort of mortifying when it says the graduating class of 2014, and I'm sort of like, what year are we in now, you know? <laughs> uh, so the shoot t took place, I mean, I, I probably was there about a hundred days in all, uh, but sometimes just hanging out, some, much of the time shooting, some of it not useful. Um, and then uh, we edited, and then it, I, I wasn't getting paid, so then I had to go take a paying job, and then I waited and hoped that the Soros people would come through with money, and then get, you know, a bunch of months later they did. So it just took a long time, but I would say like 80 to 90 days of shooting and, uh, and uh, almost half a year of editing, which for a short film is very unusual. Indeed. And Dave, how long were you... Well, with Br Brian? Brian's film came together relatively quickly. I'm, I'm, I yeah. feel bad. Yeah, I, I oh, see oh, that. Oh, no, no, no. Right. Just <laughs> change the subject. Um, uh, no, but but um, but I think one of the reasons that it came together is Brian was really ready to have someone listen to her. When we arrived, the first interview we did with her was it was weird. We came. We finally got permission from her lawyer and went to her home and sat her down. And, and she just burst into tears and basically wouldn't stop crying for the whole interview. And we, we were coming back going. I don't know if there's a movie here. Like you can't watch somebody cry for an, an hour. It's just not that, you know, and really, she lost her composure. So we came back again, and she was, got increasingly more together as we interviewed her further. And it became clear that this was really a therapeutic moment for her. She really had a dam to, that was building up. And her, her boyfriend, who was here in the, I, I never learned this till we had a screening with her, he said that after we were done our filming, she changed, and she brightened up and a big weight had been lifted. And it reminds me of what was going on in your film, because I, I have a criminal justice back. I used to be a prosecutor in New York City. We probably were against each other in some cases <laughs> a long time ago. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, man. At the end of this Q&A, we're going to require that they hug each other. Yeah, exactly. Think we, can, we can do that. We can do that. Um, but uh, the, the, the thing is, people have, the listening to people and having them download their traumas can help them get past a certain point. And I think your, I was watching the characters in your film and how they were evolving mm -hmm. and how, you know, they were given respect and, and stability for the first time. And for Brian, she was given, returned to having respect. She was demoralized deeply. And, and so there's this sort of common lesson about, about what to do with people who have been injured. And I think the criminal justice system is filled with people who have been injured and not properly healed. So there's a, you know, I, I like to think the, uh, thank you for I, I, I putting felt, them together. Yeah, and I felt injury in almost everybody that I filmed, including some who didn't make the screen. And sometimes that injury is not immediately apparent, you know, but um, there's just layers of injury, layer upon layer of injury, some of it from prison, some of it preceding prison. And that's also, though, as a filmmaker, it, 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 there's there's no uh, there's no defense. There, there, there was, the 
people were incredibly ex accessible. And that's part of that same thing, that, that the wounds are there, and, they, and the wounds are on the surface, and there's this ferocious determination to um, a, a make a better life, to do a, to have a better shot this time around. But at the same time, there's a nagging fear, not in everyone. I mean, one guy just went off and robbed a bank, didn't sweat things too much. But you know, but in many of the people, there's a, a nagging fear of like, I need to, there's not just that I have to find a job and that I have to get, get transportation and that I have to repair relationships with my family and all those things, but also there's something that I want to try to fix. And I think we can all identify with that both in that we all feel that there are things that we want to fix, and we also know how unbelievably difficult that is to do. So that, that fear hangs over almost everybody I met at the restaurant. Yeah, and just as a sort of a, a different facet of this, really the same story, but coming from a very different angle, I think that Brian had showed her resilience in her life before the event, you know, in our film, before she was taken down by the cop you know she I framed right. the film we framed right. the film very much about it around her um, resilient her natural um, courage and you know determination to make a better life as I you love that when she said people think I come from money <laughs> but I don't. yeah you know, she great. really pulled herself up you know without a mother or a mother who died when she was six, 15 and um, really without a father at all present um, and despite all that you know, the system's still out there to take her down. Um, so her resilience, I think, was built in, and despite that, look what one afternoon can do to somebody, yeah. so. Yeah. That, that uh, doesn't surprise you, Lenny? Hmm? That, that, that sense of dislocation after uh, that kind of encounter? Not only the sense of dislocation, but I think that, um, you know, I, I guess I was struck by a sense that uh, of, of um, this perpetual sort of anxiety uh, that it gets created in many communities just by the mere approach of police. And so I think that her sense of the police being the enemy and, and how that formed what happened, her hesitance, her questioning. And so I think that despite the resilience, there's that thing that's in the back of her mind. You know, she said, you know, I, I followed Trayvon, all these other things I never thought me, but in the back of your mind it is, it could be me too. Mm -hmm. And so I think it sort of sets the context for, for, for that interaction. So I know that uh, Brian saw the film for the first time at our screening the other night, and she was talking about how making the film with you was, was cathartic. How did she feel after seeing the film and, and also have your subject seen, Knife Skills? I think she was, she was cool with it. No, she really, she <laughs> loved it. And um, I'm, you know, I, of course, hoping she would. Um, but I think above, all what I heard from her after the screening and later that night is that she really felt like, wow, maybe I really can do something with this. Maybe this really will open up people's minds and wow. you know, we won't just be statistics. And, um, and uh, so that's pretty thrilling for her to take something that otherwise you know, was filled with yeah. shame and, yeah. Yeah. and you know, something she really wanted to just pull the covers and over her head and pretend didn't happen. Do so something with it. And yeah, something yeah, with it. yeah, so. Yeah. Um, not everybody who's featured in my film has seen it. You know, uh, these folks work really hard. They work in the evening when I'm having screenings. You know, like in, uh, we had the, we had six screenings in the Detroit, uh, the, in the Cleveland area, and uh, and and still there were. Uh, uh, Alan has not seen the film. Alan's mom saw the film and loved it. Um, uh, Dorian saw the film and pretty much liked it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and uh, and Marley w just sent me the most beautiful letter after she saw it. Mm -hmm. Everybody who you saw there is still working in food, except for Dorian, who's the guy who said it's like the breakup with the really hot chick. Mm -hmm. he, he he's doing great, uh, but he's not in food. Uh, everybody else is in is in food. But you know, people say to me, "Oh, well, why didn't you do like a little wrap up and tell you know where everybody is?" But the truth is that. Uh, these are folks for whom fluctuation and variation is constant. And if I <coughs> said, you know, Marley's in Florida and she's in food, you know, sh that might not be true two months later. You know, like even just staying in touch with those folks is not the easiest thing in the world. You know, phone, phone numbers change, uh, localities change, all that. 
All right, we have time for a question. So who has one to make it good to close us out? You guys want to pick? I'll Did let you somebody pick. Somebody way in the back there. OK, go ahead. Uh, it's not so much a question, but a comment, and uh, a thank you. It's not often I get to see a film that I can identify with and I can see myself in. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a math teacher. Uh, well. I taught math in New York. I retired recently. Um, during the Giuliani and Bloomberg administration primarily, um, I was a driver in New York City. Math people count stuff. I counted being stopped by the police over 300 times. Wow. I like, I, I guess I kept it in and never really thought about it and perhaps a lot of the anxiety that I still feel when I pass the police car has built up over time. I don't think I'm angry about it, but I think that Speaking up right now is helping you. Wow. wow, thank you for that. Couldn't end on a more perfect note. Yeah. Thank you all thank so, you much so much for speaking up. Thank you, thank you for coming. <laughs>